So in our last video, we introduced a few of the guidelines to ethical conduct of research in Australia. And then we had a look at some examples based on Disney villains. What I'd like to do in this video is introduce you the guidelines for the ethical conduct of research with people in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And also have a look at some real life examples of research that's ethically dubious. So I'm going to read from the standards here, but if you want to actually find more detail I definitely recommend you go and read this document, Research with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples and Communities. It's a really beautiful document and it has very detailed and real world examples of what ethical conduct looks like in research. So the central element of the framework is spirit and integrity. It's a core value that binds all the other values together. The first part, spirit, is about the ongoing connection and continuity between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples past, current and future generations. And the second part, integrity, is about the respectful and honourable behaviours that hold Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander values and cultures together. Cultural continuity includes maintaining the bonds and relationships between people and between people and their environment. It also includes responsibilities in respect to spiritual domains. Equity is reflected by a commitment to showing fairness and justice that enables Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's culture, history and status to be appreciated and respected. And respect is expressed as having regard for the welfare, rights, knowledge, skills, beliefs, uh, perceptions, customs, and cultural heritage, both individual and collective, and the dignity of people involved in the research. And what you're probably noticing here is that there's some overlap, some synergies between this framework and the national statement that we discussed in the previous video. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's ways of sharing responsibility and obligation is based on their kinship networks. And this process keeps Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's ways of living and family relationships strong. These responsibilities also extend to caring for country. Reciprocity recognises all partners' contributions and ensures the benefits from research outcomes are equitable and of value for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities. And central to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander societies and cultures is the recognition of core responsibilities. These responsibilities include caring for country, kinship bonds, caring for others, and the maintenance of harmony and balance within and between the physical and spiritual realms. A key responsibility within this framework is to do no harm, very similar to one of the items in Mockler's uh, lived practitioner framework. And that includes avoiding having an adverse impact on the ability of others to comply with their responsibilities. So I think this is a really valuable framework when you read it in light of the national statement, because it's sort of... It's not only about a, a way of connecting and respecting and valuing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, but it also goes to that question of who are you and what kind of care and ethic do you bring to the world and your relationship with others, particularly those from the First Nations in this region. So next I want to have a look at some examples from around the 1960s. Um, they're really powerful videos and you can watch the full thing on YouTube, but I'll put, and I'll put the links in the description of this video. The first is Jane Elliott's blue-eyed, brown-eyed experiment. Here's a brief clip. You think you know how I would feel yeah. to be judged by the color of your skin? I don't, do you think you do? Mm. No, I don't think you'd know how that felt unless you had been through it, would you? It might be interesting to judge people today by the color of their eyes. Would you like to try this? Yeah. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Since I'm the teacher and I have blue eyes, I think maybe the blue-eyed people should be on top the first day. I mean, the blue-eyed people are the better people in this room. Uh -oh. oh, yes, they are. Yeah. Blue-eyed people are smarter than brown-eyed people. This is a fact. The brown-eyed people do not get to use the drinking fountain. You'll have to use the paper cups. You brown-eyed people are not to play with the blue-eyed people on the playground. Well, the brown-eyed people in this room today are going to wear collars so that we can tell from a distance what color your eyes are. So the gist of the experiment goes that on blue-eyed days, Jane Elliott would, as teacher of that classroom, um, the kids with blue eyes would be treated uh, amazingly, they would be allowed to go to lunch early, they'd have more time to do work if they wanted it, or less work, and it was just a, a blissful experience for them. And the brown-eyed kids got treated like crap. And then the next day, she flipped it, so the brown-eyed kids could experience what it was like to be treated really well, and the blue-eyed kids were treated with prejudice. The idea behind this was to raise awareness uh, for civil rights issues in the United States at the time. And it comes from, um, you know, Jane Elliott's got a really strong activist position and she wanted to educate these kids on how to be better people. So I think it's a really interesting experiment to talk about in terms of its ethics violations because it obviously 
if you think about beneficence and risk, there's some good intent behind why she's doing it, but there's also a risk involved. If you watch the whole video, you can see that kids become very, very uncomfortable with the way they're getting treated. In fact, some are getting very, very upset. The lessons from it stick with those student, those students for life. Um, so there's, there's videos later on of these kids that they've grown up and they've learned so much from that experience. Some of them, some haven't. But I think it's really interesting as an example of practitioner research or as an example of an ethical violation because it's controversial. It's not unproblematic. These kids are being treated in a way that could hurt them and it definitely causes them pain at the time. So from an ethical position and, and reviewing in light of the national statement, you might reflect on is the risk, is the harm here justified in light of the potential benefit of that research? Another example which is probably... Less ambiguous is the Stanford Prisoner Experiment. This is quite a famous experiment, and here's a brief clip. Shortly after I finished this Stanford Prison Study, Milgram embraced me and said, I'm so happy that you did this. He said, he said because now you can take off some of the heat that, that he's had to bear a load of having done the most unethical study. How people respond to a cruel environment without clear rules. I think he and everybody else who came down into that situation got caught up into that situation. And the sense that this was an experiment, that began to fade away. It became just life. We frankly didn't anticipate what was going to happen. And we tried to really test the power of the environment to change and transform otherwise normal people, much as Milgram had changed or transformed otherwise normal people in an obedient situation, we wanted to do it in a prison-like situation. So fundamentally what happened in this experiment is that they encouraged people to be cruel to other people, and of course they did. And then the experiment kind of got out of hand. And Zimbardo mentions in one of these videos that he himself as the researcher was compromised. He wanted to keep going, he wanted to see how far these people would go, how cruelly they would treat other human beings. This raises a huge wealth of ethical violations. We can see why there's some, some justification, I suppose, to this research, because you can understand something you would think about the way humans respond to a stressful situation or the way that humans respond to positions of authority. Uh, it tells us a lot about human behavior in this contrived environment. But can you justify that risk in light of the harm that it's doing to those people? And I would argue you can't. And it would definitely be considered an ethical violation if it was run through these national standards today. So basically what we've reflected on over these past two videos are these issues of merit and integrity, beneficence and risk, anonymity and confidentiality, justice, respect, privacy, cultural sensitivity, informed consent. And you can consider those in light of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and people's framework that we talked about in this video. So the important thing to remember here is that you're not just trying to spot Disney villains in your research. There's not always a big bad. What this is about is thinking about who you are as a researcher, a practitioner, and a person. It's about your conduct and your ethical relationships with other people in a research context and in a practice context. It means that you're being attentive to the relationships and the values that you bring to the world and that you look for these examples of risk, harm that you might be doing and find ways to mitigate or eliminate those problems.